Psalm 51, and this is going to be our eighth sermon on the book of Psalms, and we're looking at uh, the attributes of God, attributes of God. What is God like in the book of Psalms? <clears throat> Psalm 51, and let me read to you from the ESV. To the choir master, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then will you delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. So this is a very well-known passage uh, to many of us. Uh, I believe I have also referred to this psalm a few times as I have been here at Magnify Together. But this story has a background. This story has an incredible drama behind this psalm, when this psalm was written. So we have seen many times how David wrote psalms as he was a younger uh, shepherd. Right? He wrote Psalm 23 as he was a shepherd boy. And he declared, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But there are passages where he was uh, running away uh, in the desert as he had become king. And this psalm was written at his peak of his, quote-unquote, career as a king. This was written when everything was at peace. This was written when everything was all established. He was living in a magnificent palace. And he had nothing really uh, in need. And this psalm was written. And it all started with this parable. 2 Samuel 12. And this is the back story of this psalm. This is prophet Nathan uh, convicting David of his sin that he had committed with Bathsheba. This is what he says. So he tells a story. This is a parable. There were two men in a certain city. One rich and the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds. But the poor man, on the other hand, had nothing but only one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his own cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. What a story, right? It's a, it's a crazy story. 
And after David heard that story from Nathan, he got so mad. And he said, I want to find this man, whoever you're telling me about. I want to find this man, and he better be put to death. And whatever land that he has taken, that better be repaid four times. And then Nathan said, that man is you, David. And we know, uh, we're familiar with the story how David committed adultery with Bathsheba. Right? He was a king. He had everything that he needed. A palace, and he had uh, several wives. As it was a it was a, a custom to uh, to do in in that time, and he had concubines as a king, uh, but he sought after this one woman named Bathsheba, which was a wife of who, not just some uh, Uncle Joe down the street, but this man, the husband of Bathsheba, was one of his mighty warriors that fought alongside David, and one of the men uh, that would give his life up for the sake of saving King David. And it was his wife. And David, even though he knew that it was his wife, Uriah's wife, he still took it, took her anyways, and made her uh, his, uh, his wife. And then, to cover up uh, his lust, to cover up his adultery, he would bring back Uriah from the battlefield, and he would try to lie to him, and tell him to go into his house and lie with Bathsheba so that you know, his adultery will be covered. <clears throat> but then, because of his loyalty, he does not go to the house. And he will stay outside the doors because he knows all of his soldiers are fighting in the battlefield. Um, so later, David just ends up just getting rid of him in the battlefield. Right? He sent him a letter in, in a nice covered envelope and said, Bring this to your captain only to find out that letter had a command from David telling put Uriah in the very front and kind of push back or, or step back that, so that he will be killed. So this is the sin that David committed. He committed adultery, but he also committed murder and he tried to cover that up with lies. And then guess what? He just went, up, went on with his life. But God saw and God knew. Even though nothing really happened immediately, sin always comes with a price. Sin always comes with a price. And one year later, God sends Nathan. So Bathsheba became pregnant with David, and a child was born. And guess what? He was uh, ill, and later he dies at a young age. So his child dies, and David loses a lot of his soldiers, a lot of his men, and Nathan now convicts David of his sin one year after. And when you commit a sin, there's really nothing heavier to, to bear. Right? It destroys you from the inside. As a Christian, you know, the, the most difficult thing to me for me to bear is when I sin. And that sin is so uh, disappointing, not only to God, but it disappoints myself. And it becomes such a burden. And we become broken. And in our Christian walk, we constantly wrestle with our sin. And what is sin? Sin is simply choosing something else other than God. Right? For our ultimate pleasure, for our ultimate joy, for our ultimate source of happiness, whatever that we choose outside of God, all of that is sin. So sin is not just adultery, sin is just not murder, but sin is you choosing something else for your happiness. All that is sin. So with that said, none of us are free from sin. But the key is this. When we sin, when this is unavoidable, when we sin, what should we do? How are we restored? How can David come out of this huge hole that he has dug for himself? Adultery, lust, and then murder, and then lies. And then just living covered up for a full year, deep living with that guilt. And I'm sure even though nothing happened immediately, I'm sure he lived each day with a heavy burden in his heart. What can we do as Christians when we sin? And through this passage, it is my prayer that we see how David finds grace to come out of this heavy, and destroy, a sin that destroyed him 
from the inside out. So what do we do when you know you've done something wrong and you don't know the path forward? You feel helpless and lost. You cannot undo what you have done. We constantly battle our pride. We constantly battle our, our lusts. We constantly battle choosing something else other than God. What do we do? The only way for a Christian to take a step forward out of our ditch is repentance. And repentance is the only key for the broken heart. And it will happen for sure. We will never be completely free from sin as a Christian as long as we're living in a sinful body here on earth. But it is my prayer that every time we sin, we pray that we will not let that sin destroy us. Because Satan will tell you that. Satan will tell you you're not good enough to be a Christian because of this sin that you have committed. You're not good enough to be a child of God. How can a child of God commit such a sin? And Satan will tell you lies. And he will tell you there is no way for you to be loved by God again. For no, There is no way for you to be restored as a man and as a daughter of God. But our only way, the only key the only thing that we can do as a Christian is to come to God in repentance. In genuine repentance. So what is repentance? What is repentance? Simply put, Westminster Shorter Catechism is a collection of all the teaching uh, questions that the early church have put together. And this is what they said about repentance unto life. So it says, there's a slide, it says, a repentance unto life is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ, does with grief and hatred of his sin, turning from it unto God with full purpose of an endeavor after new obedience. I mean, it's a long definition, but simply put, it is as you genuinely feel the grief as you feel genuinely be broken, as you feel that brokenness in your heart, in your soul, turning against sin, but also turning towards God, is a genuine repentance unto life. So repentance is not only turning from your sin, but it's turning to God. Just like last Sunday, right? Last Sunday we heard a message where in order for us to live a blessed life, not only we need to flee not only we need to flee the ungodly company, we need to fill our void with the Word of God. So like, likewise, a true sense of repentance is turning from sin, but turning towards God at the same time. It is not just a feel, uh, feeling of sorry uh, or remorse, but it is being convicted, becoming inwardly humbled and visibly reformed. It is a directional change of life. And we're going to see how important it had been for Christianity. So not only that is mentioned here uh, in Psalm 51, repentance, the idea of repentance is mentioned 60 times in the New Testament also. And guess what Jesus' first message was? As Jesus was born, as He was beginning His ministry, He preached. And guess what was His first message to the world? His very first message was, Repent. And believe the gospel. Repent. Repentance was Jesus' very first message. And you can't understand Christianity without repentance. And not only that, Martin Luther, who brought about Reformation from the Catholic Church. Right back then, there was only a Catholic Church in the 1500s. But this man, Martin Luther, was reading the scriptures and he saw how corrupt the Catholic Church was. And as he was reforming, he nailed 95 theses on the door of a Catholic Church in Wittenberg in 1517. Are you guys familiar with that Reformation? Right? Um, October 31st, uh, on Halloween Day. Right? He nailed, and with that began the Reformation. And the Protestant Church came about. And out of the list of 95, guess what the very first list was, on the list was. This is what he wrote. The, the number one thesis that he began by saying was this. 
When our Lord and Master Jesus Christ said, Repent, He intended that the entire life of believers should be repentance. Should be repentance. So not only Jesus understood the importance of repentance and the priority of it too, Right? Before he preached the kingdom of God, he preached repentance for the people. And Martin Luther also, as he is reforming, as he is tearing himself out of the Christian church, back then the Catholic church, the corrupt church that was driven by man's greed, as he is tearing himself out of that church in the word of God, the very first thing that he wanted to make sure was that we are all about repentance. And he said the entire life of a believer, entire life of a believer, not only in sense of area, right? Not only this area of, of my life is going to be of repentance, but this and every part of it, but also the sense of time too. From the moment of our birth to the, to the moment that we breathe our, life, our last breath. In its entirety, it has to be about a progression of, a repetition of this genuine repentance. So it all begins with repentance. And it is this repentance that we need in our lives in order for us to be restored. Do you know why we need this all the time? It's because we are sinful all the time. Because we fall all the time. We wrestle with our sin all the time. And the only way that we can be restored as a man and woman of God, is by you coming to God in repentance every single day. Our entire life of believers should be repentance. So what does repentance look like? The first step, as I said, was repenting from your sin. So turning against, turning from your sin. Look at the pronouns that he uses in the first five verses. Right? He says, Look at verse 1. He says, Blot out my transgressions, O God. And then verse 2. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquities and cleanse me from my sins. Verse 3. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Right? It is easy to point out someone else's sin. <clears throat> Doesn't it? I mean, it's so easy for you to look at somebody and say, Oh man, you've done that wrong. But it is so difficult to look at your own sin. I mean, David took us a full year to realize his sin. And he took Nathan's conviction of his sin to realize that he was so broken. But then he, once he realized that it was his sin, he didn't uh, you know, blame other people. He didn't shift any blame or he didn't blame it on the situation. He didn't blame it on Bathsheba. Why did, he, why did she have to take a bath on, on the roof of the top, uh, top of the roof? And you know, she, he didn't do any of that. But he owned it all up. He said, it was my sin. It was my iniquity. It is my transgressions. And I'm going to own it. That is the very first step of restoration. Do you need to, do you want to live that blessed life? Do you want to live a life that is filled with genuine sense of joy instead of constantly living in fear? The very first step that we need to take is realizing how broken we are. Realizing how in need of a desperate help we all are of a Savior. No matter how hard we try, we will always fall short of the glory of God on our own. So realizing that we need a Savior is the very first step that we need and turning from sin and repenting of that but if we stop here it is only not only half the work if we stop here at your repentance your repentance becomes very selfish your repentance will become very self-righteous here's the catch many Christians only stop here when it when it comes to repentance. When somebody says, you need to repent of your sin. We only say, God, I'm sorry for this sin. Please, would you forgive me of what I have done here? And that's the end. But if we stop here, it becomes selfish because you only repent because you don't want to feel bad about your... And you don't want to have that guilt in your heart. That's probably the reason you repent. 
And if that's the only reason you repent, then it becomes a selfish repentance. And you also want to repent because you don't want that bad stuff in your life. You want to be that perfect guy or perfect girl. And for that reason, you repent. And if you do that, if that's the only reason you repent, then your repentance becomes a self-righteous repentance. Oh, I'm clean. I have come clean because I have repented. But repentance has to go a step further. Definitely has to have the next step, and that is repenting towards God. Turning to God. Because without this, our repentance will not be complete. And here is why. So for example, let's say if you are uh, captured by, uh, let's say, a terrorist. A terrorist captures you. And your life is in danger. Right? If nothing happens, you will certainly die in their hands. And repenting only for your sins. Is like, God, please save me from, from this uh, terrorist. And then you're saved. But you're not being returned home. That's the extent of a halfway repentance. And that is why we certainly need the next step of repentance. That is, you know what? Yes, save me from the hands of the Taliban or, or, the, or the terrorist. But bring me home. Let me be among my family. Let me have that full sense of joy. That's the extent of full restoration, full repentance that we need. And look at the language of David. Look at the language of David. Look at verse 6. And look for a vocabulary that, that depicts his desire to this full repentance. Look at verse 7. It says, Purge me with hyssop. I shall be clean. Wash me. I shall be whiter than snow. So that's what he desires. And then this is what else he desires of his re uh, repentance. Verse 8, he says, Let me hear joy and gladness. And let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Let me rejoice in it. Look at verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. Restore to me that joy. How much are we repenting? Not only against sin, but how many times are we repenting towards this joy? How many times are you requesting God, pleading with the Lord to restore this sense of joy? As a Christian, we only come short by dealing with that sin because we don't like that guilty feeling. We want to come clean. We want to be a good person. But we fail to be restored unto that joy. And when you think about it, this is the story of the gospel. Did Jesus come to only save us from sin? Did Jesus come to only save us so that we don't go to hell because of our sin? What's, what do you think is the real reason Jesus came and died on the cross for you and defeated death and rose again from the dead after three days? What do you think is the real reason? He wants to take you. He not only wants to save you from eternal death, the real reason Jesus came is so that He will take us with Him and that we will be with Him in heaven in His fullness of joy. And that is a full scope of why Jesus came. Right? Our Christian life should never be about the half that story, but it should be more about the latter. I know all of you guys here in this room, none of you are really newborn Christians here. This is not your first time being in church. You've been, church, you've been around church many years, or at least some time to understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. So, so the latter part, the second part is the part that we need to really focus on. Your life should be more about seeking God in that joy. In that joy. But for us to come to this place, it takes purging. Look at verse 7. Purge me with hyssop. And then wash me. I shall be one of And then it took, it, it took his bones to be broken for him to realize that he needs to come to this place of rejoicing. Look at verse 8. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. 
Sometimes we fear this brokenness. And that is why it's difficult for us to repent. It is difficult to confess our sins. Right? We don't want to be judged. We don't want to go through this broken feeling. We don't like being vulnerable. Right? Isn't that true for all of us? We don't like the feeling of being broken or being exposed. But sometimes we need that brokenness in order for us to live. There was a fascinating story that I came across, I want to read to you, that really got my attention. It's a story, it's a real story. 1987, 1987 in Texas, there was a little girl named Jessica McClure. She was 18 months old. Can you imagine 18 months old? She's barely two years, and she's now starting to walk, right? And she was at her aunt's house in the backyard, and that backyard had a well opening up of eight inches, right? Eight inch opening, and it was a well, and she was playing with, uh, playing around it innocently. So she had, she was sitting on the edge with her feet dangling, and she was playing, and as she was trying to get up, her feet slipped, and then she fell in that well, and she dropped 22 feet below ground, one leg up, one leg down. She was wedged like that. It, it made a big news. It was a huge. It was a huge news because it took 58 hours to bring her out. Because you can't drill. You can't go down. An adult can't go into that small hole of eight inches. So they had, what they did was they drilled another hole parallel to that well. Okay, only five feet apart. They drilled 20. Uh, 27 feet or 29 feet down a vertical sh shaft down parallel to that hole and they drill th their plan was to drill five feet across to get to her only to find out that it was surrounded by solid rock so at first they got the old drillers to drill down and then because they couldn't get across it they had to get the mining engineers that is why it took 58 hours and the medical personnel grew increasingly alarmed and warned that the dehydration and shock was becoming more of a threat than her being entrapped in that well. And finally, rescuers reached Jessica, but they could not pull her out because of, of the way that her body was wedged, right? But as they took their vital, uh, her vitals, they shouted these heartbreaking words. These four awful words they said, pull hard, she does not have more time. Pull hard to save her, right? She, you may have to break her to save her. So all what they did was they pulled the last time, but none, none, of, none of the more additional injuries occurred, but they were able to save her. I mean, as I was reading that story in a, in a book, I was like, man, I mean, it's crazy how, how they were willing to risk breaking her. But it, it, lead, it leads to saving her life. And many times we fear being broken. We fear being uh, vulnerable. We fear uh, that, that we are broken in our confession, in our sin. But many times God sometimes allows our bones to be broken. Just like David said here in verse 8. Let the bro bones that you have broken rejoice. Sometimes we need this brokenness in order for us to be saved. And it is important that we always come each day in prayer, in confession of our sins. Even though it means exposing all of your dirty stuff. Even though it means just digging up what is broken, what is dying inside of us. We must confess our sins, but not only turning against it, but asking God, clinging to God for life. Restore unto me the joy of your salvation. But true repentance does more than that. True repentance does more than you being, becoming alive. True repentance restores your worship. Restores your worship and it will change your life. It will change your life's direction. Look at verse 13. This is what David said. You know what? God, 
I am broken. I am so messed up. I have committed adultery. I have committed murder. I have taken someone else's wife. And I am in pain because I have sinned. Break me, Lord. Make me alive. And this is how my life is going to change. Verse 13, I will teach transgressors your way. And then sinners will return to you. And then look at verse 14. My tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. Verse 15. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praises. So he's saying, you know what? My life from now on, it will be all about you, Lord God. I'm going to declare your forgiveness, your love for the rest of my days. And then what else it does? It restores your worship. Here's a catch, you guys. If you don't come with that sense of brokenness, if you don't come to the Lord in your repentance, in the true sense of repentance, all the worship that we do here, it becomes meaningless. All the Christian name tag that we carry, it all becomes a lie if you're not truly repenting in the heart, in our daily walk with the Lord. I don't care how awesome you look as a Christian. I don't care how, how much you give an offering. But if you're not living this life of repentance every day, turning from your sin, turning towards God for joy, it all becomes a lie. Look at verse 16. This is what David said, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I will give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. He has given many burnt offerings after he has committed that murder, after he has committed adultery. But he knows that until now, all that was meaningless to the Lord. But now as he is repenting, God sees the deep, deepest parts of his broken spirit. Now God is going to be pleased with his offering. Look at verse 17. The sacrifices that God wants. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. A broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. God hates empty worship, but God will not despise a broken and contrite worship. And then God, rest God restores the whole city. Do good to Zion in your good pleasure, verse 18. Build up the walls of Jerusalem, and then we'll offer worship again unto the altar. It is my prayer that we are restored. I hope that we are stopped worshiping God in a fake way. I hope that we're not a Christian that is all about just looking right, but deep inside we're all rotten to the core. But just like David sought after the deepest parts of his sins and just dug it out and put it in front of the Lord, this is what I am, Lord. I am born sinful from birth. There's nothing in me that can produce that is pleasant unto you. I need you, God. Break me apart, Lord. Break all my bones if it, if it requires for me to come to you for life. He's not afraid of, to be broken. He seeks life in that restoration. But here's the catch, you guys. Romans chapter 2. This is the final verse I want to share with you as I conclude my message. Paul is writing this letter to the church of Romans. And this is what he says. Even your desire to repent comes to the Lord. Let's read that verse. Romans chapter 2 verse 4. It is also in the bulletin. Let's read together in one voice. Ready, set, go. Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? So he's saying, don't you realize that it is God's kindness that leads you to repentance? So even your desire to have that kind of repenting heart comes from the Lord. So, so how can we repent then? All we can do is just surrendering to the Lord and just pleading with God. God, I need you. I can't even repent on my own. Help me, Lord. I need you. I need you to help me to repent. I need you every, in every single area in my life, in my Christian walk with the Lord. I can't produce any single thing, including repentance. So I need you from ground zero up. 
So with this desperate sense for God's Spirit, I pray that Magnify come, comes together to worship, lives every day with this desperate sense of desire for the Lord, with this heart and mind.